Hello everyone, welcome to our Egyptian online seminar group. First, it could be microphone off. Then, if you have any questions, you can ask our speaker after his presentation. I have great pleasure of welcome, welcoming Professor Robert Nickel. Robert Nickel is one of the top accounting thought leaders in the world. He is a professor of accounting at the University of Florida. Professor Nickel is currently the senior editor of the accounting review and has previously served as a senior editor of auditing a journal of practice and theory. He is, he is the director of International Accounting and Auditing Center uh, in the Fisher School of uh, Accounting. He also holds uh, the title of a research professor in accounting at the University of Oakland Business School and research professor in uh, auditing at uh, Colobin uh, in Belgium. Uh, professor Nickel research is published in top ranking journal in accounting. He has uh, served on uh, the editorial boards of several academic journals, including contemporary accounting research. Now we will start our seminar with Professor Robert Nickel. Dear Prof, can you open uh, your mic? There we go. Let's try that again. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your inter kind introduction. I'm happy to be here this morning. It's obviously not morning for everyone uh, that's in attendance. I see some people I know from all over the world. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, hopefully uh, you'll find this somewhat interesting. Um, I, agreed, I, I agreed to this because my host was very nice in allowing me to talk about exactly what I wanted to talk about, a topic that has become very uh, sort of near and dear to me as I've gotten towards the latter stages of my career. So what I want to talk about is how uh, we can advance our understanding of auditing by having a better understanding of the economics of auditing. Uh, so let me give you a little background of how I've gotten to this point. I mean, I've been doing this for a long time. And of course, every one of us has a story to tell. Uh, I'll give you a very short version of mine. Back in the, well, I won't tell you what year it was. Uh, I was actually a CPA and an auditor with a big eight firm. If those of you who've been around long enough to remember, they were actually the big eight. Uh, and I've been doing audit research for over 40 years. Um, actually, I've been at the University of Florida for over 40 years now. Uh, so that doesn't include my PhD program. Uh, at the time I was a PhD student, in reality, there was very little audit research going on. Uh, probably you could count the number of people doing audit research on the fingers of one hand, and you, I'm not, I doubt you'd need all your fingers to do that. Uh, so because of that, I actually uh, decided I would get my PhD in operations research. Now, I was, I was a practicing auditor, as I said. Uh, but when I got to the University of North Carolina, which is where I got my PhD, I figured out that, first of all, they did not have much of a research group compared to what we have now, what we, what we think of now for UNC, uh, and that the accounting group were amazingly people who had, were old school textbook authors, you know, and had led, led their generation. Um, so I decided to look into the operations research department at UNC, which has a very good uh, reputation at the time, and that's where I ended up getting my, uh, doing my thesis. Uh, I'm not going to try to explain what that title means. Uh, so given the long career, I mean, most people who have been who are around a while go through some phases in their career. Uh, I can look back now and say that my research has had four distinct phases. Uh, none of them have completely ended, really. Uh, they've all kind of built on each other. I started out with a normative modeling perspective that would be consistent with operations research. When I figured out that nobody in the real world used to use these normative models to make decisions, I went and started to ask myself why and went into behavioral experimental type research and did that and still do that occasionally. Uh, then I had an opportunity to uh, basically work with a, no a number of accounting firms on development of new audit methodologies. So I was able to uh, essentially rebrand myself again and into field studies for new audit methodologies. And starting in 2002 with the passage of Sarbanes-Oxley and the creation of the, of the PCOB in the United States, I got very interested in economics and regulation of auditing, which has kind of carried me through uh, most of what I've done in the last 15 years or so. Okay, now given this long-term perspective, I have a big picture here. 
And what I would conclude, and I'm going to talk about this in detail over the, over the course of this uh, session, is that the statistical foundation of audit research has expanded tremendously. We have extremely well-trained econometricians and psychometricians who do the work, uh, do auditing research. However, in my opinion, the theoretical foundation has not advanced nearly so much. And this has created some, some problems in our field that I'm going to touch on. So. Let me start off with a really fundamental question, because I find that when I talk to diverse audiences, and I'm assuming this is somewhat diverse, uh, a lot of people don't really know what an audit is. They think they know what an audit is. We all kind of have an instinct as to what an audit is. But I think we need a technical definition we can agree on, and I have my own, of course, uh, that will allow me to uh, get into the research issues that we might be addressing through economics. So if we Start off with a simple definition. For example, you look up the definition of an audit in a dictionary, and I just happened to pull up Miriam Webster online. It's defined as a complete and careful examination of the financial records of a business or person. And that's probably an adequate definition for most people, but it doesn't really actually get to the uh, full flavor of what auditing involves. And it certainly doesn't really lay out many guidelines as to or what things we might want to research related to auditing. So I said, okay, let's find a more complicated definition. So I decided, let's look at a textbook. Arrington Lebecki is, the, is probably the uh, original major audit textbook that we use in, today in classes. And they define an audit. Uh, this may not be the current definition. It's probably at least one edition ago. Uh, they define an audit as accumulation and evaluation of evidence about information to determine and report on the degree of correspondence between the information and established criteria. Now this definition is a bit dense, I find, but nevertheless, it does raise some issues that are lacking from the more generic definition. For example, this idea of what are the criteria and what is evidence, uh, these things start to raise questions of things we can study. Uh, I, of course, have my own definition as I alluded to. And so my definition, it's, which doesn't really have any uh, authoritative support, but it works for me and I define an audit as an economically motivated professional service designed to reduce information risk that relies on the knowledge and skills of experts used in a systematic process that considers the idiosyncratic needs of a client where the outcome is unobservable and subject to market forces and regulatory constraints. Now that's really dense, right? That's a very complex definition. So let me parse this out, break it up and try to illustrate why I think this definition is useful from a research point of view. And so there's six main components to this definition that I would focus on. And in some ways, the first phrase is the most important, an economically motivated professional service. Uh, this really brings us into the area of incentives and agency theory, which we know has been applied to auditing for many, many years. Okay, And that the value of the audit is in reducing information risk. Now, what is key about this phrase is that it's a focus on economics. Uh, it's not a focus on compliance, meaning we don't, audits don't exist because of a regulatory structure. Now, a regulatory structure exists and it does influence auditing, but we also know that auditing predates any form of regulatory structures and that economics, uh, or auditing actually has an economically valuable service to provide by reducing information risk. And sometimes we, I think we lose sight of that in our current regulated world. We forget that, in fact, Auditing provides a true value economic service. And so that's an area where we could be doing more research. Uh, we've, I think we, we just take some of these things for granted now and don't actually ask ourselves, what is the uh, value of the audit to different stakeholders, for example? And I'm gonna come back to that point. The second part is that this, the audit relies on the knowledge and skills of experts, right? This brings in the whole area of cognition and behavior, which is not really economics, although you could get into behavioral economics. Uh, and the, the point here is you can never take judgment out of the audit process. Uh, there are people who have argued that you can, that you can automate an audit completely. Uh, I'm not one of those people. I think judgment will always be there because of the nature of audit evidence and the uncertainty involved in audit evidence. Um, which leads to the third piece that the audit is a systematic process, right? The, every firm has a methodology that they follow in general and this suggests that we could be looking at audit through an input-output lens, that input-output economics have something to tell us. Now, this is not an area that's got a lot of research. I've worked in it, but not a lot of research exists because often it requires data that's not generally available 
to researchers, often data from within accounting firms. Although because of the global nature of auditing research these days, we are seeing this change. Uh, the audit deals with idiosyncratic needs of a client. This is actually, I think, a fairly important point. Uh, it, 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 what it suggests is even though the process is systematic, the application itself has to be tailored to the individual client. Every client is different. Every client has different business objectives, plans, goals, strategies. They have different risks. They have different controls for those risks. They have different transactions. In the you know, when you get into the detail, they have different people. They have different talents. And so every client is going to have different issues that have to be considered. And that's what I call the idiosyncratic needs of the, of the client. This actually brings in an area that is, I have just written a paper on, it's in accounting organizations and society that introduces the concept of service economics into the auditing literature. Uh, and I'm gonna come back to that point too, because that actually changes our perspective on some of the, some very important attributes of auditing that we have previously, in my mind, taken for granted. The outcome of the audit is unobservable. This is actually a fairly important point that people kind of, so sometimes they'll throw this away, you know, they kind of accept it, but they don't actually ask themselves what it means. And again, I'm gonna get into that a little bit more detail, but it also, because of the uncertainty here, it, it suggests the role for decision theory. Finally, and that's actually where I worked in the first 10 years of my career. Uh, some of this is starting to come back uh, as we see more and more research based on things like machine learning. Uh, some of these things are actually uh, simply extensions of what I would call decision theory and operation research. And finally, the audit is subject to market forces and regulatory constraints, okay? So we, we know this, and this is actually the area where a lot of research goes on these days, particularly in the regulatory uh, area. Uh, but we've seen more research into market forces and co local competition. And so this, again, this is clearly an area where economics can come into play. So the point here is uh, we have lots of people doing audit research around the world, and we're all working loosely in the area of auditing, but many, but we're working in different pieces and aspects of auditing, which in a sense all blend together to come to a better overall understanding of auditing. And I think that's really valuable. It's valuable to keep that in mind as we go through uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, for the rest of this session. So let me talk a little bit about the current state of audit research as I see it. Now at this point, I have to, I have to make a caveat. Uh, nothing you hear today is the official position of the accounting review. Uh, obviously, I, uh, as a senior editor, I have influence over what happens there, um, but you know, I'm not the only auditing editor, for example, and not everybody's going to agree with everything I have to say. I know this from experience, uh, and I could tell you, if I had time, I could tell you a couple uh, anecdotes of getting into, let's just say, discussions with well-known world researchers about some of the issues that I have laid out. So this is my perspective, and it's not necessarily going to influence what could happen at the accounting review if you were to submit a paper. But I think it's, it's something that we're seeing a trend in. And that is basically what I call the data race. That we have researchers actually all over the world now chasing, trying to find data that is unique, unusual, and powerful for testing audit issues. Actually, for testing any accounting issue, but I'm talking about auditing, obviously. So what does that mean? Well, what we've created in my mind is a never-ending search for data. Uh, now that's, that's helped by the fact that we have a whole lot of new databases available. The PCOB has databases, audit analytics, which many people know. There's data, a lot of data comes out of China and Europe, and I could add Australia. Uh, we have new data acquisition techniques involving internet scraping and other things. I mean, it's, it, Python seems to be a mandatory uh, course now in most PhD programs. And so this data is rapidly expanding and is available to audit researchers. And so that's a good thing. Uh, doctoral students are becoming increasingly skilled with these sophisticated econometric AI, machine learning, and data analysis techniques. You know, 10 years ago, uh, you would not see the word machine learning in an audit paper. I mean, 10 years ago, you may not have even seen the word uh, propensity score matching. I'm not sure how long we've had propensity score matching in our literature, or entropy balancing, or there any number of uh, econometric techniques. In fact, my son, who is a mathematical economics major at the University of Southern California, is uh, at Christmas time or our holiday break this year. He he asked me if I would look at his honors thesis, and uh, I said, "Sure, I'll look at." It. And he asked me, "Do you know anything about synthetic controls?" 
And I said, no. <laughs> so that was the end of that conversation. Uh, so, uh, you know, even as a 21 year old undergraduate, he knows more about econometrics than any PhD of my generation would, obviously. Uh, the, however, we start to get in some things. These powerful new statistical techniques do have an advantage in that they overcome some research design concerns. We see a lot of discussion these days about endogeneity and identification. Now, I don't, I'm not convinced that we can solve both of these issues purely with econometric techniques, uh, but obviously I'm not gonna suggest we should use inferior econometric techniques when we have better ones we can use. But so we are trying to, you know, our obviously researchers are trying to address endogeneity and identification particularly. But this is also creating, in my mind, now this is where my opinion comes in. This is creating, increasing the separation between empirical analysis and what I want to talk about, the theoretical foundation of audit research, right? That I point out fairly regularly to people that while econometrics is part of economics, it's not by any stretch all of economics. It's a piece of economics. It's a valuable piece of economics, but it seems that our students are often only learning econ econometrics and not learning much about economics. And I'll give you some examples as I go through. Because, and here's the punchline, and the reason I want to talk about this, audit theory really hasn't advanced much in the last 40 years. Uh, we still are basically making very generic references to agency theory. We're still making generic references to Dan Simonick's work in 1980 on audit fee models. And we're still making references to Linda D'Angelo's theory of audit quality, which also dates from 1980. So really it has been 40 years since we've had a major theoretical advance. We've had minor ones, tiny ones, and one I've been involved with one that I'll point out. Uh, but we're still looking for, I think, a general overall lifting of the quality of audit theory and auditing. So what happens then when data starts to outpace theory? Uh, well, we could take a, any almost any topic you're interested in auditing, okay? And often on the econometric side, there's two ways to look at it. You can look at it from a macro level or you can look at it from a micro level. Usually macro level means uh, high level, firm level uh, type analysis, whereas micro level may be individual type analysis. So let me give you an example. Let's say you had a research question. Uh, this is one that's gotten a lot of attention lately. Do partner attributes related to morality and integrity influence audit fees or audit quality? Okay, now the question is the same whether you're going to take a macro approach or a micro approach, but how you approach that question is different. And this is where we begin to see the search for data. So if you want to take a macro approach, you might look at something uh, similar to say religiosity, which has gotten some uh, publications using this kind of data by geographic area. It could be by country, it could be by state in the United States or even county in the United States. It depends on how refined the data is, how granular that data is. But it's very, it's, it's very generalized, in fact, in, the fan, in a sense that it doesn't actually address what an individual thinks about this topic. It simply talks about mass patterns uh, of how individuals are, as a group think. And so for those of you who are interested in something like this, the World Bank produces something called the World Value Survey, which has survey questions, meaning data, that relates to this kind of issue. Uh, and I've had a couple of papers that have used that data. It's very interesting. You can learn a lot about how different cultures look at different types of things that would be arguably related to morality and integrity. Now, on the micro level, we've seen researchers who say, okay, we, I want to actually look at people. I want to look at individuals because that's where, you know, in, in morality and integrity is an individual attribute. So, for example, we've had papers that have looked at parking tickets uh, or traffic violations of individual partners. I had a paper recently at the Accounting Review that looked at whether a partner had a pilot's license. Uh, okay, and the argument is that these, at least in the, it's clear in the traffic violations, if you, are, if you are a very aggressive driver, you're possibly going to be a very aggressive audit partner. Uh, it's less clear to me that if you're a pilot, that you're going to be an aggressive audit partner, but uh, you know, I don't need to get into that debate at the moment. So we have people who are really searching for, I would call them obscured sources of data sometimes, because uh, they we're trying to match, mimic essentially or proxy for these attributes that we're interested in. So what we once we have this data source, what we then do is usually we just plug it into a standard model. 
could be involve audit fees, it could be, involve audit quality metrics, accruals, restatements, whatever. But the, the actual econometric model is going to be fairly straightforward and not particularly uh, new and exciting. Uh, now, some of the econometric techniques may be interesting and new and exciting, but the actual underlying regression model is kind of what we've been doing for many years. Uh, and all except we're gonna plug in a new variable that wasn't there before. So now there's advantages and disadvantages to both of these approaches. Uh, one could argue that the macro level has more external validity because it has more direct links to the attribute you're interested in. One could argue that yeah, religiosity would be suggest a direct a fairly direct connection to morality. Uh, whereas the micro level, while you can get data that's actually precise to the individual, our parking tra the, uh, our traffic violations really reflective of morality. I mean, I might argue that any good partner is going to have lots of, and you live in a big city, you're going to have parking tickets. It's just a fact of life. Um, so, any, but in any event, there are differences and advantages. Is what, but what is lacking then is if this econometric approach is the true, what I would call cognitive part of this, right? Because a third way to approach this would be simply say, okay, let's see if we can run an experiment just to pick one possible way to do this. Uh, where we assess inherent morality within an individual using some uh, acceptable instrument and then run experiments using either with a, a measured variable or a manipulated variable related to morality to see how the, uh, these auditors as participants in an experiment behave. Now, what is lacking here in this question is why? You know, why would this occur? What is happening here? And this is why I think the theoretical construct needs to be more clearly and rigorously laid out for this type of research. It's like, okay, we can just kind of wave our hands and say, yes, okay, because I'm more religious, I'm more moral. That may or may not be true. Uh, it's the same thing would be said about traffic violations, right? So what is the underlying theory that actually justifies this link that you're making? And here we have a mishmash. It could be any range from anything from pure economics to anthropology for that possibility. Uh, running through things like evolutionary economics, which is something I'm actually interested in, or sociology or psychology. Uh, so I actually asked, asked my PhD students in a PhD seminar once, would we be interested in knowing how many brothers and sisters an audit partner has? Okay, think about that. How many brothers and sisters does an audit partner have? Would that tell us anything about the type of audit they're going to do? Now, you might argue that in evolutionary economics, 2000 years ago, being from a large family with lots of brothers and sisters made the family more successful, probably made it more likely to survive. Okay, so that was 2000 years ago. You could probably find a similar result in anthropology. Does that mean in 2021 that having more brothers and sisters as an audit partner makes you a better audit partner in some way? Does it matter which in the sequence of brothers and sisters you are? And more importantly, what does it mean? Let's say we actually found that the number of brothers and sisters are correlated with audit quality. What does that tell us? Does it tell us something about recruiting by the firms? Does it tell us something about regulatory behavior by, by the government? It, you know, it's not clear to me what we've really learned there that's going to be of much use because pro presumably uh, the number of brothers and sisters you have is an exogenous at the point that you're going to be made an audit partner, right? You already know how many brothers and sisters you have. You can't go back and change it. So th it, 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 th this makes me wonder what we're actually learning from some of this research. I'm not arguing we shouldn't do this research. This research can be extremely interesting and powerful. But what I am arguing is we have to think deeper about this theoretical construct because it tells us the story that we're trying to actually capture. Okay, moving on. So if I don't think there's enough theory in the audit research that would focus too much on econometrics, you know, let me give you a bit of a summary of where we stand. What is the current state of theory in audit research? Okay, so our theoretical foundation in audit research, I think, can be fit on two slides. I think I have two slides on that. And it covers the entire theoretical structure of auditing. First, we know a fair amount about audit demand and pricing. Uh, you know, Dan Simonick started this line of research in 1980. It was a seminal 
extremely important series of papers he did. He put this literature on the map. Uh, he deserves a lot of credit for that uh, because we didn't know anything in 1980 about audit demand and pricing. Now, back when he did it, he had to collect data by hand. Essentially, he had to do it by surveys uh, because there were no audit fee disclosures in the United States. There are interesting disclosures in Australia and New Zealand, but nobody in Australia and New Zealand had thought to do this yet. That came shortly thereafter. And so uh, Dan Simonick really started this. Uh, we summarized this in my paper with David Hay in 2006 in Carr, which of course is way out of date because this literature has, has continued to expand rapidly. But what does it actually tell us? What is the theoretical foundation of this research? One, it assumes that there are two contracting parties, that there's an auditor and there's a client, but the client is not really clear. Is it management? Is it the board? Is it the shareholders? Who is it really? But anyways, we kind of assume that there must be two contracting parties. Uh, now, one of the limitations of this, and this is why I want to run through this, these theories, is there's no role for other stakeholders, right? We talk a lot in today's economy about how organizations and how auditing influences stakeholders beyond just the shareholders. Not so much in the United States, although it's starting, but in other parts of the world, clearly stakeholders uh, are important. And so our models that we use at this point about demand are based on these binary or a senior series of binary agency relationships. Uh, why binary? Because anything more complicated is extremely difficult to model. And so we end up with a binary, you know, a basically uh, shareholders versus managers or cre creditors versus shareholders or subordinates versus superiors in an organization. And in the last few years, we've seen auditors versus the client. And so uh, the problem is in the real world, these things all happen simultaneously and it's not been well captured in our models. Secondly, the lit this, this literature is based on a really important assumption and that is audit markets are perfectly competitive, at least within certain segments, which could be separated, for example, by size or location now. But why is this assumption so critical? Because it allows us to model audit fees with a single equation. And that equation actually reflects supply. It does not actually reflect demand. Demand is actually left out of the analysis. We basically assume that the fees are driven by production, meaning the cost of the audit is the, or the fee, the price of the audit is the cost of doing the audit plus some contingent losses that may occur plus some reasonable competitively acceptable markup. There is no effect, there is no provision for demand that some firms or some clients might want better audits than others. And I'll come back to that point in a minute. Uh, further, also kind of subtly in this is that audits must be efficient in equilibrium, that all auditors are actually doing a very efi an efficient audit because if they're not, their fees are going to be too high and somebody else could take the client away. Uh, that we know from a little bit of evidence we have on input output analysis of audits is probably not true. And part of the reason is audit markets are complete, are, are not complete. There are no perfect audit processes to match the perfect client. So we have an imperfect fit, which means there's random noise or, or in the production process. Uh, finally, uh, Simonek originally made the assumption that audit quality is captured by the firm brand name, meaning that an audit that's done by Ernst & Young is the same everywhere, every country, possibly, certainly every market in the United States, and that the brand name, so an, e an Ernst & Young audit is an Ernst & Young audit, and there's no variation in quality. Now, if you think about that assumption, it actually makes local offices and individual partners irrelevant to the equation. But we know that there are differences. And we have lots of research to show that. So the model, the theoretical model in which we build our research doesn't actually justify the conclusions we're reaching necessarily about different levels of analysis. Moving on, audit quality, the other area that we haven't had much new theory on since 1981. Basically, you know, there, most people who do audit research could probably recite this definition in their sleep. Uh, the market assessed joint probability that a given auditor will both discover a breach in a client's accounting system and report the breach. There's a couple interesting aspects of this uh, definition. First, the, 
the Linda used Linda D'Angelo used the word breach instead of say a misstatement or error. I think that's because she's an ec economist and uh, so talks more like an economist than an accountant. Uh, uh, we would just say, we'll discover a misstatement and report the misstatement. And often what we mean by report the misstatement is we'll go to management, we'll say, fix it, change it, correct it, right? And we have that about ability. And if they don't, we would consider giving a qualified opinion. Uh, but what's more important about the actual statement of definition is the first phrase, the market assessed joint probability, right? Th this means it's a perception. Quality is a perception. It's not a reality and it's not an objective reality. It depends upon whose perception you're using. And in this definition, she's using the market, whatever, the, however you might interpret that. Normally we just talked about that as the capital market in the United States or the UK, okay? But the point is, it's not really actually known precisely. It, is a, it suggests a distribution of potential quality. And I'm gonna come back to that because when we think about the audit risk model, uh, now, this is a very nuts and bolts, real world audit issue. The audit risk model drives the way we plan and execute the audit. And embedded in the audit risk model is this concept that there is always going to be a residual risk that the auditor gets it wrong, that the auditor comes to the wrong conclusion. We hope that's a small probability. We say high, we say high assurance, right? We talk about, we provide high assurance. That suggests very small probability of a residual risk but it doesn't mean zero risk. And there's no possibility to have zero risk because the, the market wouldn't pay for it. And it would actually be uh, technologically impossible to have a zero risk audit. I mean, think about a company like Walmart, you know, 10 million transactions a day. How are you gonna audit that? 100%, at minimum, we're gonna have sampling risk, right? So sampling risk means residual risk cannot be zero. But more interestingly for our discussion is that this definition has two components that we, we really focus, focus on. One is auditor competence or expertise, which is essentially the ability to discover the, the breach or the error, and auditor independence or objectivity, which is the willingness to report the breach, to actually do something on it. We all, okay, so first, in, in order to have an auditor be effective, they have to discover or detect existing errors, and then they have to be willing to actually do something about it. Right, so a breakdown in either dimension would suggest reduced audit quality. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking about the latter part, independence, uh, but the first part is just as important. But here, even here, we have some challenges that we should be addressing. One, there is a certain idealization of audit quality in this definition. Again, it's consistent with the Simonic model that suggests that the uh, essentially quality ba is based on homogeneous outcomes, right? That when the auditor is done, it doesn't matter what the client is, the auditor should have a certain level of comfort, a certain level of very low residual risk. But more importantly, is there's an assumption that's very implicit here that these two critical dimensions, expertise and objectivity, are in fact orthogonal. I'd say independence, but I already used the word independence for something else. So we'll say orthogonal, which means that they're non-substitutable, okay? Which also means, another way to put this is you can, in theory, increase auditor expertise without having any impact on independent, auditor independence and vice versa, right? That by, you can increase auditor independence without having a negative effect on auditor expertise, okay? So there's no trade-off going on here between these two dimensions. Now in the real world, that would be an extremely unusual economic situation to have an economic good that has two valuable but different dimensions to it. In this case, the two dimensions are expertise and objectivity that do not have any kind of trade-off. That you can be strictly better off by always maximizing one or the other because maximizing one does not reduce the other. Now, is that really re realistic? Okay, I'm gonna come that back to that point in a lot of detail in just a minute. Finally, and more recently, I've done some work on what auditing really is as far as an economic good. Uh, we have historically called it a experiential good, and I could have put that up as a bullet point, that auditing is an experience good. An experience good is something that you can buy, and after you've committed and used, to it, used it, you will know if you got what you wanted. You'll be able to assess quality after contracting and use. 
Okay. The 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 other possibility is it's a search good. A search good is something you buy knowing exactly what you're getting. You can't be fooled actually in a search good. It's like buying a toaster. Uh, right. You can tell what color it is. Is it made out of stainless steel? How many slots does it have for bread? Uh, what kind of setting does it have for heat? Right. You can there nobody can fool you on that. You can get exactly what you want. Uh, experience good is something like going to a restaurant where you, you, know, you think it's going to be a good restaurant, but you won't know until really it's too late. You've already ordered something, eaten it, and whatever's happened has happened. But you, you know, if it's if it's not a big deal, you just didn't like it. Uh, that's an experience good because you know for sure pretty much after the after the transaction has occurred what you have actually received. But in a credence good, there is uncertainty as to what quality you're receiving even after the contract has been completed. And it's, there's a lot of things in the real world that meet the definition of a credence good. Now, I can't have time to get into definition, in definition in detail, but it's sick, think about uh, getting your car repaired, right? Most people, most of us now do not have any idea what goes on in our car. I mean, they're all computers now, right? So if a car is making a funny noise, we're gonna to go to a mechanic and ask them to, first of all, figure out what's wrong with the car and then fix it. And they're gonna tell us something. They're gonna tell us, here's what's wrong and here's what I did and here's how much it costs. And the only thing we know for sure when that happens is that we know what we paid and we know that the noise is gone. We have no idea if what the mechanic told us is true though, as to what the cause was. And so auditing is, I think, is a credence good because we rarely, rarely know if we've done a good audit. Now, occasionally we'll see a crisis, a disaster, you know, an Enron situation or a Carillion disaster in the UK, which is much more recent. But most times we have no idea if we've done a good audit. We certainly don't know what the residual risk is. Is it 5%? Is it half a percent? What is it? We don't know. We can't put a concrete number on it. And what, dry, what draws all this together is this idea that the seller of this credence good has a strategic information advantage over the client. In this case, the auditor has the advantage. And one of the economic effects of this is it creates the potential for a seller, the auditor, to simultaneously earn economic rents, meaning above, above competitive pricing, and also deliver low quality at the same time. Now that runs counter to neoclassical microeconomics, which would say, if you want to increase prices, you got to increase quality. If you want to reduce quality, you got to reduce prices. And what, we're, what we show in that paper, in a paper that follows the first paper, uh, we show that you can actually in a credence good market get both. And so that raises some very, very important re issues related to regulation of auditing. So let me talk about this issue of the attributes of auditing in more detail. Okay, so like, as I said, we have expertise and objectivity on this slide is identified as auditor independence and knowledge base, what the auditor knows and what the auditor is willing to do, right? Now, you, you could ignore those words and think about you were going to buy a car, right? You, if you're going to buy a car, you might want a car that gets really good gas mileage or is a hybrid or, or electric now. Uh, on the other hand, you also might like have a car that goes fast. Right? So we know that when you're buying a car, cars that go fast and cars that are, that are efficient are probably not the same car, right? It's just an inherent trade-off between those two attributes, right? They're both desirable attributes, but some people are gonna put more emphasis on efficiency. Some people are gonna put more emphasis on going fast. And that's probably gonna be a function of your age and your gender and your culture and lots of other things that role into how important it is for you to have to be seen having a fast expensive car versus having a less expensive efficient car. Uh, well you can think the same type you can think the way you have those kind of trades off and attributes you can think about the same thing in auditing. So you can think about okay uh, I'd like to have a lot of independence meaning a lot of objectivity from my auditor and I'd like, I'd like to have a really smart auditor. And so as I move up the dotted line from left to right I'm moving into higher and higher levels of audit quality because I'm getting more of both, right? I'm getting more objectivity, I'm getting more expertise. But if we actually consider that these two dimensions are somewhat constrained, we, a different picture may evolve 
from what we're used to talking about when we consider the Angelo's definition by itself. First of all, there's some corner solutions here. For example, down here where objectivity is low and expertise is low, there may not be much economic value, if any. You know, you know, you've got an auditor who doesn't know what they're doing and they're not going to tell the truth. What is the point of hiring that person? So they have no economic value down there. At the other end, at the very top, you may enter, enter an area where you don't have feasibility. Uh, there's going to be a marginal, uh, a, a, a diminishing level of marginal productivity as you add more and more of each of these dimensions. Now, one part of that just derives from the fact that there's a residual risk in the audit, right? If you want to move from 5% risk to 4% risk, that may not be that hard to do. You just collect some more audit evidence. But if you want to move from 5% to half a percent, that may actually be require and an inordinate amount of additional work that is just not financially or economically viable. So at some point, you're going to reach a point of infeasibility, potentially. So, okay, so in the middle of this arrow is where we're going to actually have some legitimate uh, arrangements between auditors and clients. But the other ask to, uh, there's two other dimensions, corner solutions, if you will, that are also important to talk about. One is up here. Let me get my pointer. Uh, hold on. Where's the pointer? So up here, we have what I call uninformed independence. Here we have auditors who don't know anything, but they will tell you what they think honestly, okay? I've been known to joke that this is, I call these people journalists, but that's probably unfair to journalists. Uh, but the idea that you don't know much, but you're perfectly willing to give an opinion, maybe you're a politician, I don't know. But anyway, it's uh, up here you have people who, uh, we'll give you your, their honest opinion, but it's not necessarily based on much knowledge. The alternative is down here where we have what I call conflicted expertise. This is where you really know a lot. You're a really smart auditor, but you're not objective, right? You, 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 there's a lot of reasons why you might not be willing to tell the truth. I, this, this description, this area I describe as me looking at my wife's credit cards. I, I can tell exactly what's going on. Do I really want to talk to her about it? Maybe not. You know, so we're not going to have audits down, audit contracts down here. We're not going to have audit contracts up here or here or here. We're going to have audit contracts somewhere in the middle here. But that still gives us a fairly large range of possible combinations of independence and knowledge. So how would we figure out, in an economic sense, and this is kind of very rhetorical and certainly theoretical, how would we decide what audit contract we should enter into. Okay, I'm a client and I want to hire an auditor. And the auditor can bring different levels of objectivity and knowledge or expertise. And, you know, I've got to decide what we want. Okay, so in classical economics, you're going to use something called a client indifference curves or isoquants, if you prefer that terminology. But the idea here is there's different levels of quality represented by each, each curved line. So these are low quality audits down here. Whoops, let me get my pointer again. These are low quality audits. These are moderate quality audits and these are high quality audits. And what the curve shows, and this is just, I'm not, I'm not arguing this is what the curve would look like. This is just an idea to illustrate the rhetorical point that there's a trade-off. And why is there a trade-off? That's the key question. Why might there be a trade-off between auditor objectivity and auditor expertise? And the answer to that question lies, I think, in a very fundamental attribute of the audit which is if you're going to audit a client, you have to interact with the client. You have to talk to the client. You have to visit the client. You have to spend lots of time with the client, right? And we know, and there's any kind of theories you can pick on, economics, sociology, whatever, that when people interact, they begin to develop opinions of each other. Sometimes they're bad, but often they, you know, I like this guy. And is that gonna affect my objectivity? Right? I need to get information from this person in the client. And if I like that person, I'm more likely to take that information at face value. I'm less likely to question. This is where professional skepticism comes in. And there's some evidence that suggests when skepticism can be may go down a bit. And so the idea here is that because of the interaction, because of, you don't do an audit while sitting in your audit office, you do an audit while sitting in the client's office. right? And so this 
phenomena has the impact of influencing how you do it. Uh, so for example, I know Sarah Bonner's on the line. She has a really interesting paper that I'm, I've been looking at that talks about how habits affect how you do an audit. And you may have different habits at different clients, for example. The way you approach an issue at one client may be different than another client for factors that are unique to that client. At least Sarah, I think that's how I interpret the results. Uh, so I apologize if I get it wrong. Uh, okay, so we've got these trade-offs potentially. Now, as you move up this quality line, you're gonna go to higher and higher levels. Now, how would you decide which quality audit you want? Well, if you're in a unconstrained, non-regulated world, it's a pretty strict, whoa, that's wrong, wrong button. Let's try that again. Uh, if you do, in a, in a non-regulatory world, you just figure out what's my budget for an audit. Now, this is basic cost accounting for that matter. What's my budget? How much do I value expertise relative to objectivity? That gives me the slope of this line. So the level is the dollar amount, the cost I'm willing to pay, and the slope represents my trade-off. This one's drawn, so I put a little more ex a little more emphasis on expertise. Okay, so that would be in theory. That's the economic theory, right? But that that's not the world we live in. So how would we actually do this? Well, if we look at this, you know, we got all these possibilities, and we know that the contract is going to be somewhere in the middle of all this, you know, we might step back as an uh, as a profession. Okay, now let's step back and say, okay, I'm, I'm, we're the auditing profession. What do I think about this? Well, I might think that, you know what, if I've got an auditor out there who's trying to sell audit A1, all right, low quality, low expertise, moderate objectivity, should I let my profession have an individual that sells that audit? Or should I impose some constraints on the types of audits that as a profession we can actually deliver? And so this, even before there was the PCOB, even before there was regulation in many parts of the world, we had a self-regulated profession which said certain things are just not good for the profession. So we need to put some limits here. So one limit we put in is we said, okay, you got to have a certain le minimum level of independence. And so look, if you look at A2, right, if you're looking at this audit down here, A2 has a very low level of independence. And maybe I don't like that because if that audit goes bad, right, let's say somebody does that audit and it blows up and it turns out to be a bad audit, it makes the profession look bad. Right? We know how Enron made the profession as a whole look bad. So any, you know, you, if we let that audit go, and it goes, it goes, it gets bad, we're gonna have a big negative effect on the profession. So instead I will constrain independence. Now, how do I do that? I put in independence rules. I'll say, you have to meet certain independence rules in order to do an audit. Now, this, the, where I put this line again is just as an illustration. It's not meant to be some secret uh, guideline. It's just an illustration that when you start putting limits on independence, meaning you raise the, ba the boundary, then you're going to be cutting out part of the market that in theory could exist. So this is cut out audit A2. Well, can't sell that, you're not independent. Maybe that's a situation where you, you owe money to the client and you're not independent. Uh, it also, by the way, cut out B1 for whatever reason, just because of the way I drew it. Okay, so now let's, so we have independence rules. We know, and that those are pretty you know, standard all over the world. Uh, the other thing we have though, is we have to ask the question, Okay, what about this audit again? Does this auditor know enough? You know, we have licensing rules, right? Not just anybody can do an audit. Although I remember doing a study uh, 15 years ago in Finland where they actually had a provision that non-licensed auditors could do audits. Uh, very small clients though. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure they changed that rule. Uh, but anyway, so could, do we want this audit? You know, this is another audit that might blow up. In this case, it might blow up and be bad because the auditor just doesn't know what they're doing. So we say, no, we don't want those audits either. So what do we do is we put in standards, auditing standards. Now this could include quality control standards. This could include, include licensing standards, but basically it's, you know, there's certain levels of knowledge you must have to do an audit. Some of that knowledge, by the way, is going to be client specific knowledge, which is gathered through the interaction with the client, which is why we end up with this potential trade-off. So when you put in these rules, you end up cutting out a big chunk of the potential market and you now you're focused on 
arguably high quality lights, right? These are gonna arguably be up here, are arguably going to be the high quality lights. And that's good. Society has benefited, right? That is great. Uh, except you have to keep in mind, there's a couple of things that come into play. One, as I've told the story, these are set by prof professional standards. When they start getting set by regulators, there's a potential uh, feedback loop that I'll talk about in a minute that can occur, which can basically builds and builds and builds these standards, possibly beyond a point of effectiveness. We'll talk about that in a minute. The other thing is, once you bring in regulation, you are essentially saying you must buy an audit up here, even if you don't want an audit up here, which means the price may not be Pareto efficient. And what could one way that could manifest is if the, if the price of the audit is just too high for what I need, I say, you know, I just need to go to my local bank and show them I got cash flow. Maybe instead of buying that audit, I buy a review engagement, much less assurance, but cheaper. Right. And the bank might say, I'd rather have an audit, but I'm not going to, but I realize if I make you buy an audit, you know, then you, it's going to reduce your cash flow, which is going to affect the bank. So you, you accept the review. So it's Pareto inefficient. A third point here is where, once you bring in regulators, where these lines are, particularly the vertical one for, for standards, is, in, is up to them, right? And that can create what I would call a shadow standard. A shadow standard is a situation where we have a rule, but we know that as long as you don't violate it too much, you're okay. Think about driving a car again, right? You drive a car and you go down a street and it has a speed limit. If I was driving down, driving down the Florida Turnpike, the speed limit is 70 miles an hour. And so I know what I'm supposed to drive, how fast I'm supposed to drive, but I may say, well, as long as I don't go above 75, the police aren't gonna stop me, right? So the shadow standard is 75. The real standard is 70. And I just have come to believe, and most people seem to believe that if as long as based on driving down the turnpike, everybody seems to believe that maybe 80 is the shadow standard. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, no one's going to bother me. And so the standard is actually higher, meaning the standard is actually more lenient than it's stated. But in auditing, we actually have the opposite problem. It could very well be that the inspectors, particularly the people who do an audit inspections, may actually see the standards as being tighter than the practitioner does, meaning that it's actually more strict. And this could explain why we have so many inspection violations that get found by inspectors who come in after the audit is over, right? So the point is this creates it, some, it's tension on its own. Well, the idea, the, the idea is noble of moving quality up to the upper right-hand corner up here. There is, it's not without cost and it's not without effect on the actual audit itself. Okay, so moving forward. So, okay, I just said that. So here's the question. Does more compliance always lead to higher assurance? Now, arguably we can't answer that question except I have an answer because I did a study with colleagues in Australia, Robin Maroney and Colin Dowen, who, uh, where we basically were given access by ASEC, the Australian Securities and Investment Commission, we were, we were given access to talk to top audit partners, top regulators, and top audit, audit committee people. Uh, we talked to approximately 30 people uh, about how audit regulation was affecting quality in Australia. Now, we did this study, and it was published. Uh, actually, this graph comes from 2015. The paper was only published, I think, in 18. Um, so you can find this in the literature now. But anyway, basically, what we found is when we talked to the regulators, when we talked to the regulators, Right, the regulators and the standard setters said, yeah, well, okay, in the past we had low regulation, then we moved to high, moderate regulation, and now we're really getting good. We're getting really good, our regulation is really getting tight. Right, and as we've, as we've escalated the regulation across the spectrum, audits are getting better and better and better. Right, that's the regulator view. Now the profession, and interestingly, the audit committees themselves had a very different perspective. So while you might think the profession would disagree with the regulators, you might not expect the audit committees to disagree with the regulators. 
And what the regular, excuse me, what the, what the practitioners and the audit committee people said is, yeah, in the past, audit, audit quality was not as good as we'd like. It was actually better than what the standards required. That, in fact, there's this old expression that in the past that audit firms actually read audit quality, not audit standards. Uh, but at some point with the stru regulatory structure in place, that eventually the newer standards started to drive audit quality higher, which pulled up the actual audit quality. But here's the key, and this is the punchline of this whole paper, is that there is a concern from the audit committee and the practitioners that at some point, the, there becomes a, a, a digression between the, what the standards require, think of that as compliance, and what actually drives the quality of the audit. And we've seen a lot of literature that suggests that audit, auditors are, have started to worry more about compliance and what's going to happen in an inspection than necessarily thinking about fundamental audit quality. So this suggests a tipping point that is being arguably driven by this expectation gap. Now, in Australia, they felt they were actually past the tipping point. Uh, I have no idea if in the United States if they would think that. Uh, while the study was done in Australia, I can actually, because I was on the standing advisory group for the PCOB for three years, we, that was a large organization that gave advice to the PCOB and it involved academics, practitioners, uh, investors, and audit committee people. I had a number of audit committee uh, conversations with audit committee people essentially confirming this. They felt that their auditor was being forced to do things under auditing standards that were not helping the audit and we're actually becoming a potential, a potential distraction. And so that's the question. You know, we need to be addressing this question. I'm not gonna say this, this is true in all cases or all countries. I'm saying that this is a question that economically we need to be thinking about because this could happen. It, can be, it could actually be a cognitive issue, not just an economic issue. So if you look at this from a more dynamic point of view, how's my time? Oh, okay. Uh, we'll wrap this up fairly quickly now, hopefully. Uh, you know, so this is another way of looking at that, that, that diagram I had. Okay, so now I just have the, uh, the, the acceptable audits up here. Okay, now what happens when regulators start to come and inspect the audits? Okay, now you get, let's say you, the inspector comes in and they find a deficiency, right? They find that this audit, one audit, had a deficiency. Okay, that means that for, for that audit, it did not meet the standards. Okay, so it's a failure that shows that the, the, exp the expertise was lower than needed. They didn't gather enough evidence. Okay, and as a result, what may happen is the regulator may say, say we need new standards. We need new standards because to avoid this problem because that's what we do, right? We fix problems by issuing new rules. Okay, and that would be probably okay if that was the end of it. Uh, but even a new rule that's driven by only one deficiency creates a dead weight loss to the entire economy because now all audits are going to have to be done to these, this new rule. Even though there was only one example of a problem, all audits are now going to have to follow these new rules. So that creates a dead weight loss potentially. But that's not the whole story because it arguably could set up a feedback loop. Because we know from the PCOB that when they find a deficiency in an individual audit, they also conclude that there was a systematic failure in, that, in the system of the auditor, suggesting, for example, that maybe they did not comply with their independence rules. So you have a knock-on or secondary finding. If this is the, the initial finding is up here, the deficiency, but now they're gonna reach a secondary conclusion that maybe there's a system problem too. So we need new standards, right? New regulations to avoid the systematic problem. So now you can see this escalation, this feedback loop that's driving things up into the right, which could arguably lead to the left prior slide. The result, oh, I just did that again. Hold on a second, sorry. Uh, which arguably led to that result. Okay, now I got to do this, build this again. Let's build this again. Okay. Uh, and so then the next question, if you're changing all these standards, does that in fact create complete the feedback loop where, oh, now the auditor's got a bunch of new standards and regulations. So we're going to have more risk of finding a deficiency, which leads to the loop continuing. And that's a concern. I mean, that is a real concern. And you hear it from, from auditors, you hear it from audit committees, you hear it sometimes from investors themselves. Okay, so this is something that I think 
the theoretical model is lacking. So question is, does the does regulation actually work? Okay, because I'm suggesting it's not always going to work. I'm not saying regulation is bad, by the way. That is not the point. Regulation is necessary. And one reason why regulation is necessary because auditing is a credence good. If the client cannot tell how good the audit is, someone needs to regulate the quality. And that's, the, you know, it's a market imperfection. Uh, but the last couple of slides suggest that it's not always going to work. And this is a, one of my favorite quotes of all time. H.L. Mencken was a journalist in the United States. He basically said, for every problem, there's a solution which is simple, clean, and wrong. And sometimes you wonder if the regulation that we're seeing is actually the regulation that's going to work. So why does regulation not always work? Well, let me give you an example. Let me go back to the cars. I think if I ask the question, are cars made today safer than cars made 10 years ago? Most people would say yes. Right? There's a lot more safety devices built into the cars. They make more warning noises. They've got, we've got cameras that show us in the back. Right? We've got all kinds of safety things. So if cars are safer today, what should have happened to car accidents? They should go down, right? That would be what you expect. If the regulation is effective, car accidents should go down. Well, here's the statistics for the United States. I only could find up through 2015, not through today. Uh, but there's 10 years of data there. And that does not look to me like car accidents have gone down in the United States, in spite of 10 years of safety improvements. Okay, so that bit then leads to the question, why? Why do accidents not go down? Why does regulation not always work? And uh, actually, I just did a really quick search. This is Google research. This is not any kind of fancy research. This is Google research. I found four different theories, two of which are fairly common and two of which are more obscure. One, two of which are economic and two of which are psychological. And basically, we get unintended consequences. When you study regulation, what you're really often studying is unintended consequences. So one reason why you don't get the effect you want from regulation is the theory of moral hazard. And this is agency. This is the agency theory. It basically says that when people don't bear the risk of their actions, they will take on more risk, right? Uh, this, we talk about this with lenders and borrowers, we, you know, and all the and government guarantees of debt. You know, but the basic idea is if, if I'm not going to be held accountable for the, whatever risk I take, I'm going to take on more risk because I may benefit from it. Okay, classic economic theory. Theory of self-licensing, sometimes called moral licensing. Okay, this is more psychological based. And here the idea is that people take more risk if they perceive that virtuous actions balance bad actions. Right? If you're being good, doing the right thing in one part of your life, maybe you feel you don't have to be so good in another part of your life. So this is like the classic example of you go to the gym and work out for an hour and then get an ice cream on the way home. Uh, right? So you, you, you take credit for your virtuous action of going to the gym and then you do something that is not quite so virtuous. I'm not saying that's bad. I mean, ice cream is good. But it's like uh, we, 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 we rationalize this to ourselves. Right? We, we can rationalize ourselves into these decisions. And those two types of models are fairly known in the economics and cognitive literature. Another economic model that is less known is the theory of risk compensation. And here, people will alter their behavior in response to the perceived level of risk. It's kind of related to moral hazard, but in a more generic or general sense. And the idea here is the more safe, the more higher my perception of safety, the more careless my behavior may be. OK? Uh, Again, you can think about driving, right? If you have a wide open lane and there's hardly any traffic, forget the speed limit. I'm going to drive as fast as I want. So one thing we can do is we can make individuals aware of the risk, which will improve their response to the risk. So for example, I, I go to Europe when, when I can travel places. It's been a while now. Uh, you know, I drive in Europe a lot, particularly in the Netherlands and, and, and Belgium. And uh, yeah, you know, they come to these little roads and they narrow. They have these little narrow points where only one car can go through. And the, you know, the point is to slow people down. For, for one thing, there's lots of bicycles in that part of the world. And they don't want cars, you know, being driving dangerously around all these bicycles. And so they impose, you know, they make people aware of the risk. Uh, the, uh, and, but anyway, we do, but we know from the car example that even though cars are safe, they're safer, they're not getting, we're not behaving better. And there's actually a very fascinating experiment. I, I just, this is, this is only kind of incidental, but it's like, it's called Tulak Spike. 
And it's an experiment where they basically showed that people will drive more carefully if there's a sharp spike mounted on the steering wheel right in front of their chest, right? If you got a sharp, sharp spike staring at the chest, you will drive more carefully. Now, they didn't actually run this experiment. This was a mental experiment. This was not a real experiment. They didn't actually do this in cars. I think that might have created problems, but they found out, you know, but they found from their thought experiments that people would certainly be, aware, be made more aware of their driving. And then finally, this is more of a cognitive issue, theory of resistance behavior. And basically this theory says that the more you intervene, the less willing the target of the intervention is willing to accept your intervention, right? And I think, you know, I'm not sure about all parts of the world where you may be living, but I see it in the United States. And I certainly see it in Florida. We're getting tired of COVID restrictions. And so the in interventions that are to try to keep us safe from COVID are having less and less of an effect. Uh, I think there's even a simpler example for this. Theory of resistance behavior is uh, if you've ever raised a teenager, the best way to get a teenager to do what you don't want them to do is tell them not to do it, right? So uh, that's resistance behavior. So finally, I want to close with talking a little bit about the future of assurance. We live in a world where there's this information superhighway. We have information flying at us related to many, many different topics of very involving an organization. Uh, obviously, a big one these days is ESG or CSR reporting. Uh, we've had 10Ks, or, which is financial statements. We've had that forever. Uh, the, but an interesting question is, what's the role of assurance here, right? We are only auditing one of these lanes. I mean, you can think of this as like a superhighway in Los Angeles or Tokyo or you know, London at rush hour, right? These, these information is flowing through and we're like the toll booth that only operates on one lane. Uh, the we're, we're to hold up, we gotta check the financial information, stop. And we look at the MDNA a little bit, so we slow them down, but everybody else, go on, keep going. We're not worried about that. So this creates an, a situation, an environment where the market doesn't may actually not be aware of what's assured and what's not assured. And this brings us back to my definition of what is information risk? Is there no information risk in ESG reports? Of course there is. And should we all as auditors be thinking about how we can address some of those issues, okay? And so this leads me to consider, I think a very important topic that we, I think research could be expanding to. And that is looking at the economic or information ecosystem as a whole. Okay, so an economic ecosystem is defined as a network of businesses and individuals that are considered to resemble an ecological ecosystem because of the complex and intermittent part, interdependent parts. And if you think about financial reporting, there are many, many moving parts, right? That financial statement does not appear overnight out of nowhere. It's a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of organizations, a lot of entities involved in doing that. So what does that look like? Okay, so I went and Googled ecosystem to, so I'd have a graphic and like the only ecosystem I could find a graphic for was Jurassic Park. It was like 20, the top 20 hits were all maps of Jurassic Park. So, okay, we'll use Jurassic Park uh, as a graphic for ecosystem. Uh, except we'll call it FinRep Park. Um, so what does this ecosystem look like to us? Well, in it, we have management, we have internal auditors, we have the governance like the board, we have internal control, we have what I call process owners. These are people who actually execute transactions and you, know, you want them to get it right because that reduces errors. So all these, these are all part of the ecosystem. And all these players, all these parts have to do their job well. And then we bring in the auditor, right? The auditor oversees all this eventually. Uh, you know, it's like, I've joked sometimes that maybe the external auditor in this setting is actually a vegan rap raptor, you know, a, a raptor that has no teeth. But uh, that's, that's maybe a joke that doesn't go very far. But anyway, so we got this, we've got this, all these players going on and everyone has to do their job. And then we have, kind of offshore, we've got interested parties who do not want to have to deal with mutant financial statements getting loose, right? They do not want to have to deal with erroneous financial statements. So you got regulators, standard setters, investors, and probably other stakeholders you could list there. So all these players and organizations have to work together to make the system work. So what does the system really look like then? Well, it means because you have all these different participants, they all have different knowledges and skills. But the expertise that we develop to do this as an auditor depends on our interaction with all these people, right? And so different people are gonna have different levels of knowledge about different pieces 
of the ecosystem. This means that the audit is inherently a cooperative exercise, right? To audit means you got to interact with the client. And as I said, these interactions are going to influence our attitudes. And in some cases, our auditors are basically embedded in, if the clients are very large, we're spending months, our people are spending months with that client. And so while the idea of auditing being cooperative sounds like the antithesis or counter to independence, it's actually somewhat inherent in the process. And so ignoring it doesn't necessarily help. And finally, the objectives of some participants will align with the auditors at some time, but sometimes they won't not, they will not. So for example, think about management. Make management, if you look at an ad classic agency model, management is the enemy in a sense to the auditor, right? That's who we're, we're fighting with to get the fight right numbers. But management actually wants the right numbers too for most things, right? They do not want their subordinates committing fraud. They do not want employees of the company committing fraud. They want reliable information to make their own decisions, usually internal investment decisions. But on the other hand, management may not align with our interests when it comes to the final financial report because you know they kind of like to massage the numbers to make themselves look better to the shareholders. Right? So some ways we align, some ways we may not align. So skepticism really needs to be brought in at the right point of this audit. But more importantly, it actually applies to every, th every moving part, right? Skepticism is not just the skepticism of the auditor. It has to be every, you know, you go back to the, gra the graphic of the ecosystem, every one of those circles has a part to play. And if they don't do their part using certain level of expertise and skepticism, then the system can break down. So that leads me to my, essentially my final point, which is what is audit quality in this ecosystem? And I would raise the question that, since quality depends upon all these parts, that should we be talking about audit failure or should we be talking about system failure? Can every audit, can every financial reporting failure actually be blamed on the audit? Or are there actually, should we be spending some time talking about how the other parts of the system have failed? We are seeing more of this discussion. The PCOB is definitely having this discussion uh, as to what the role of other participants are and how do we get better and yeah, better quality out of some of the other participants. Whoops, what the, that's not supposed to happen. There we go. Uh, so this then depends upon whether the cooperation is appropriate and there are dangers. There are some real dangers we need to think about. So for example, different participants have different power. And we know, well, for example, when we've studied the issue of CEOs who are on the board of directors, that would, that's a classic power imbalance, right? And that would suggest quality problems potentially. Uh, there could be other ones. Uh, you're going to have participants in the system who will defer to others. You know, you don't want an audit committee who defers to management or who distracted or actually resist the audit uh, or basically are there and they, they don't know anything. I mean, these are issues about the quality of, you know, obviously if you have an ignorant auditor, that's bad. But sometimes you wonder why certain people get on the board of directors, for example. Uh, poor integration of these, you, you need all these competencies and you need to be able to integrate them all. So those could all lead to low quality and they, they suggest different, slightly different things we should be studying than what we are. Uh, one of the implications of this view though is standardization may not advance quality. The idea of trying to make every audit the same is not going to necessarily lead to better audits because of the unobservable outcomes and idiosyncrasies. And the punchline is cooperation. Do, looking at the system as a whole can lead to better audit quality. For run rate, and these, this is actually based on evidence we know now. There is a benefit from knowledge specialization. The more the auditor knows, the better the quality they're gonna do. And we have literature on auditor client negotiations about audit differences that suggest that. Uh, we also know that interaction creates trust. Multiple play interactions between two people creates trust, makes one person more likely to trust the judgment of the other. And so the auditor has, a better position to say, no, we're not sure, we're not comfortable with that. And also there's an economic argument that because of this interaction, there's co-investments in service quality. The auditor makes investments in servicing that, qual that client, but the client actually makes investments in, in the audit process itself, dedicating people and resources and systems to make that audit happen. And those investments are not trivial. So that kind of links these makes these two groups somewhat connected that it's hard to disconnect. So the end. So I guess I did take all the time. I apologize, not much time for questions. I'll spend a couple minutes. 
So just two quotes, just to show. I'm, I've been doing this 40 years. The Mark Patterson, even though the quote comes from 1875, basically says, we never get to the end, even after 40 years. And I like David Wood, George quote, that if you want to make a big leap, and, and this applies to research, two small steps aren't going to cross a big gap. You need, you need a large jump. And that's what I would suggest for those interested in, in theory and auditing research. So I'm going to quit on that. And I will throw it open just for a couple minutes to any questions, if there are any. And uh, again, I apologize. I guess I took too long. Thank you very um, much, dear Professor. Uh, thank you very much, dear Professor uh, Robert Nickel, for uh, your contribution and your effort. It's really excellent, uh, excellent, an excellent presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Now, if uh, anybody have any questions, you can uh, use the raise hand function and open your mic and ask your question. Uh, yes. Well, now that I see all the participants. I see some friends out there that I haven't seen in a little while. Nice to know. <laughs> yes. Anybody? Uh, are there another, are there a question? If if anyone have any questions, you can open your mic and uh, and ask your question. Sandra, uh, Sandra Shan. Yes, you can ask. Okay. Thank you very much. For the valuable presentation of the uh, about the uh, audit, uh, sir. I, I I want to ask about the uh, IC curve slide that Doctor had presented for you. Yes. What's your question? Curve slide, sir. Would you like to open the IC curve slide? Okay, hold on. Uh, yeah, I got to share again. I might shut that down. Hold on a second. Uh, Doctor, uh, Doctor Brenner, uh, Brenner. That was about to uh, expertise versus the independence. Oops. Let me do. I'm sorry, you gotta find it. Hold on. I'll give you the one that's got all the stuff on it. So this one is this the one you wanted? Hello, do we lose him? Uh, Dr. Uh, Renier? Yeah, yes, my, my question was also related to, to this slide, Robert. Um, um, but, uh, well, I'm, I'm sure that you tell me in a minute that I'm wrong, but... Um, me? Would I tell you that, Reiner? <laughs> yeah, but, but uh, you never did it. But um, I think... Uh, there's a bit a mix between independence rules, which I agree could be more or less strict, and auditor independence. And, and uh, from my point of view, uh, I, 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 I would like to question whether auditor independence is a continuous variable. Uh, for me, it's more a binary variable. I agree that independence rules or independence regulation are uh, more uh, a continuous variable. But is independence, auditor independence, really a continuous variable? Could the auditor be a little bit independent, a little bit more independent? Or is it just being independent or not? Well, OK. Yep, I'm going to tell you you're wrong. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was, uh, well, I'm, I'm let's, sure let's, that this... Let's clarify this, OK? I mean, you, I understand your point. I would actually interpret the rules as being binary. You're either in compliance with them or you're not. Uh, yeah, but but you you, you might have uh, two different independent rules or one hundred. Uh, so um, uh, with regard to one rule, I I, I agree it's binary. But uh, you have a, a collection of a, a large number of independent rules. Well, that's true. And if you violate any one, you're out. Of, you're not independent, right? Yeah. So, but let me clarify. Let's let's let's, let's take it a, be a more a, a better direction. That I consider independence in appearance. Right, you, 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 whether it's one rule or 10 rules, right? These rules are set up based on the appearance of independence. What I'm talking about here is I'm actually talking mindset, the uh, independence in fact, which we cannot directly observe. And I think that can follow in, on a continuum. Uh, you know, I like some people more than others and some people I like a lot. And so in a sense, and you know, one person I marry. So there's a, there's a range mm. of people there. Yeah, but if you, uh, if you, if that's, you can... what that's what I'm trying to get to is the mindset. Now I understand you're 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 looking at the rules, and 
yes, there are many dimensions. We could put this in n-dimensional space. I could draw. I could draw this curve in n-dimensional space with n-dimensional independence rules, and, and you see a frontier of independence. Then. Yeah, but, but if you go back, Robert, to to uh, D'Angelo's definition, and uh, just uh, ignore the market as as part of it, uh, but uh, independence is defined as the willingness to uh, to report a breach. And uh, the auditor either reports or doesn't report. He probably doesn't uh, uh, just report a part of the breach. Well, that again, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the observable outcome, which is not the same as the mindset. Uh, and by the way, I'm not convinced you can ignore what you just said. You can't ignore the market point. I mean, th th we use this definition. We need to use the whole definition. Uh, but, it's, but the point is, yes, you're right. After the fact, you either adjusted the error or you didn't. You either detected the error or you didn't. On the other hand, what if the error is not near, not clearly an error, right? Because we have so many estimations that come into our, you know, you, you've got, you know, when you're looking at loan losses in a bank, right? When you're doing the audit, you've got at least two numbers. You've got the auditor's number and you got the management's number. And the only thing you know for wrong is they're both, or the only thing you know for true is they're both wrong because the future is going to tell you which is the right number. And it's on a just, it, you know, right now we can simply look at a distribution. So really what I'm trying to get at is that there are distributions based on judgment and limitations of knowledge and things we cannot observe because of the way we think as human beings. When you put in the context of the rules, yes, I can see, does this, does this partner own stock in the company? Yes or no. Does this company borrow money from the client? Yes or no. You know, is the partner's spouse the C CFO, yes or no? The, I mean, and those are very blatant independent violations, right? Uh, but you, you know, the rule book for independence rules in the United States is about that thick. You know, it's like two to three inches thick. And so, literally, once you go through, the, it, you can think of it as a checklist. All these, have you complied with all these rules? And we know firms don't, by the way. Firms are always getting caught out for violating these things. I don't think they necessarily do it on, intentionally, which also then raises a question about judgment. And uh, may I just uh, ask, because I saw uh, further hands and I don't want to steal all the time from the others. So um, uh, a problem which I permanently fight with is uh, how can we measure auditor independence, in particular when we do archival research? I don't think we can. I think we have, le we have less ability to measure independence than we do to measure audit quality. We know how bad audit quality measures are. Or how limited they are. Yeah, but the, the, the basic problem is that the audit quality metrics we use uh, cover both uh, if, if we, competence and independence. And very often, uh, the effect have, uh, has uh, different directions. And that is, uh, certain, uh, certain means, certain measures may improve independence and decrease competence. Right. We make, we make assumptions, though. For, the, the classic one in my mind is the assumption. When we look at going concern opinions as a measure of audit quality, there's two ways we can do that. One way is to simply look at the incidence of going concern opinions, right? The, the, the propensity to give a going concern opinion. I think that, you know, we are, I think the argument there is that that's independence, right? Am I willing to give a going concern opinion? But the other way to look at that is the going concern opinion correct, which brings in expertise. Right? And so the idea that if you give a going concern opinion to a company that doesn't deserve it, I'm more conservative and therefore, I guess, more independent, but I'm actually, but I am I'm actually a better auditor. Yeah, but, but uh, I mean, uh, uh, giving an unjustified going concern opinion <clears throat> may then be being over independent. That's right. <laughs> more than you need. Okay, I agree with that. So okay, let's but, go, uh, I agree but, with you on that. So let's let's move on to yeah. somebody else. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Abdel Fattah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohammed Fattah, a professor of auditing in uh, Faculty of Business and Shams University. I would like to thank uh, Professor Robert for this great lecture, and I want to ask uh, about the relationship between. Uh, auditor report uh, objectivity and uh, the timing of issuing the report in the context of depending on risk-based internal audit. Thank you very much. Okay, you, uh, 
the, I, I'm not sure I understood the question. Is about how fast the auditor puts out the report? And I'm not sure. Sorry? We, I'm not sure. It, it, the que is the question about how quickly an auditor releases their report? I'm sorry, I didn't I don't it. hear well. I'm sorry. Well, uh, I'm not sure I, that I want the speed... To, I want Go to ahead, ask sir. you about uh, a quantitative measure of the audit report objectivity. Huh. <laughs> no, I don't have an answer to that question. We have, we have audit quality measures we use in research. Everyone agrees that they all have limitations. And you know, part of the problem is we, can't, we cannot observe audit quality directly in most cases. Therefore, we can only measure things that we think will be correlated with audit quality. So we look at things like accruals. Uh, restatement is our restatements, actually correcting errors would be a good example, a better example of audit quality. But when you start getting into more, some of the other measures, and I don't have time to debate them, but you know, in the United States, for example, we would people use uh, the incidence of an internal control weakness report as a measure of audit quality. I don't agree with that for reasons I don't have time to go into. Uh, we see uh, people use uh, for analyst forecasts, meeting and beating forecasts, or just earning small profits as measures of audit quality. But part of the problem is these are all compounded with reporting quality. You know, the management's decisions. And this gets back to the ecosystem argument. This is not being done just by the auditor. This is being done by people making other decisions, all which have to come into play. And the auditor does not have, does, does not have some uh, divine power to impose their will on the system. The best they can do is issue a, going, a qualified opinion if they think it's bad enough. If, they've cro if, the, if the situation has crossed the threshold, they, they will issue a qualified opinion, but we know that nobody, where that threshold is, is up to the auditor's judgment. Robert, I have a comment which is directly related to this question, because the question was uh, on audit quality metrics within the auditor report. Uh, what do you think about the idea to, oh. what do you think about the idea to uh, use or to calculate a normal number of uh, key audit matters uh, and uh, to uh, use the abnormal key audit matters as a proxy for audit quality. Oh, well, that, you know, that I, I can see the logic for doing that. I, I wonder how much of a, of a dispersion you're going to get, particularly in company. And we're seeing, and at least in the United States, we're already seeing boilerplate. I mean, there's this initial transition uh, and the first movers tend to have a lot, you know, you know, Rolls-Royce is obviously the poster child for a key, you know, for, a, for an expanded report, but we're not seeing anything remotely close to Rolls-Royce with later adopters, right? Uh, and I have, I have heard people, uh, accountants, I mean, uh, corporate people say that I don't have any, I don't have any key audit matters in my audit. Yeah, and th that's the message they're giving to the audit partner. Now the question is, will the audit partner push back. And so, you know, it's another reporting decision. And so what, you know, my concern is you could do exactly what you say. Okay. What is a normal standard, you know, by industry, uh, longitudinally across time, you know, what's an expected number of key audit matters. Uh, and then look, I try to identify companies that have more. Uh, is it better audit quality? Is it bet more risk? I don't know. Is it something else at work? Is it a function of the same reason why different people pay different audit fees, right? If I, if I have a client is willing to pay higher audit fees, is it because they just want more from their auditor and therefore they're more, more willing to accept more critical audit matters? I mean, this is a, and I think it's a fascinating research question that hasn't gotten much attention yet. I have seen a couple of papers that have tried to use abnormal key performance indicators, excuse me, CAMs, uh, and uh, it's not clear to me where this is gonna go yet. And, you got smart people working on it, so we'll see. Now, another possibility, I, which I thought you were going to, which is the idea of putting audit quality indicators into the audit report, and that's a whole different question, because you know you can say how many hours were spent, on, and we some countries report this: how many hours were spent by the audit team, how many hours were done by the partner, 
right? And so these you think of as audit quality indicators. But, but, that, but then the question is, who audits the auditor report? That's an infinite regress. There's no answer to that question, because then who, who audits the people who audit the report? <laughs> right? Other questions, please. Uh, uh, Sandra Chan. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Robert, uh, for this. Sandra Chan, I haven't seen you in forever. I know. it's uh, It's been such a long time. It's really nice to see you. Well, my pleasure. I got time for your question only, I think, and then I'm going to have to depart. But what do you ask? Uh, I had a quick question regarding the, the information hybrid that you uh, were talking about. And you're saying that auditors would only be looking at the financial report side of things. So I was wondering, uh, what do you think, or what is your suggestion on internal audits? Because internal audits seem to be having their hands in pretty much everything else in addition to the, the financial reporting as well. So do you think it's about time we treat internal audit on par with external audit and kind of promote them a bit more? Well, it's kind of an it's kind of an interesting question. This is the advantage of being around forever, like I am. You know, when I was actually doing audits, very few companies had internal audit departments, and if they did, it was probably a bank. Uh, you know, then we went through this period of developing internal audit, and the argument has always been, when should is it bad for a company to outsource their internal audit work, right? Uh, but internal audit work is just audit work. And when I was in public accounting, I did what you would call internal audit work, at least when it comes as far as it applies to the financial statement. Um, I actually think we should have another debate, which is when is it appropriate to insource auditing? Because internal auditor cannot be independent, right? So if independence really matters, how much should we be? Right? I'm not saying we shouldn't rely on internal auditors, but the, 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 you know, it's not all one way. It's you have to have to have this discussion go in the other way. That where and this really comes into the ecosystem view that I that I've been talking about because it suggests that you have to balance these pieces, right? You cannot abdicate one role to somebody else and expect them to do it at the same level of quality when you're the person who's supposed to be doing that role. And so now what what internal auditors have been able to do is expand their scope well beyond financial reporting, and that gives them I think an advantage on understanding the risk structures particularly and the control structures. They have the time and the mandate to go into detail systems at a granular level to see how they work, which is something that an aud external auditor in theory could do, and we do to some extent because we have to give an opinion on internal control in the United States. But nevertheless, uh, it's more, certainly more costly to have an external auditor do it. And so that that's, I think is a great question. I don't know. I don't know that we have an answer yet. Uh, you know, maybe we'll never have answers. We just have accept the things we accept um, from practice. So on that note, I thank you all. I'm, I unfortunately have another commitment, so I'm going to have to leave. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to send me an email if you wanna follow up with anything. I'd be happy to dialogue with anybody who has some issues coming out of my presentation. Cause I'm sure that Reiner is not the only one who disagreed with things I said. I expected it from Reiner. <laughs> thank you very much, dear Professor uh, Robert Nickel. I think that you have done very well with, with answering a lot of questions uh, there, dear Professor uh, Robert Nickel. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, ended to all that remains for me today. Is thank you everyone that joined us, and I thank you uh, very much for taking the time uh, I would to present to us today, dear Professor Robert Nickel. It's been really appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I enjoyed this. Appreciate it for the opportunity. Thank you.